This episode is brought to you by VH1's RuPaul's Drag Race, The Vegas Review. RuPaul is opening a live LA Vegas residency. Go behind the queens as six of the most sensational drag race superstars put on a show of a lifetime. It's Viva Yas Vegas on RuPaul's Drag Race, Vegas Review. New series premiere Friday, August 21st, 8, 7 central, only on VH1. Welcome to Bachelor Party. I'm Juliette Littman. No Bachelor this week. We got the DNC, so we didn't even have the greatest seasons ever. But reality TV, it continues. I just want to say, more Selling Sunset content will be coming, so catch up on that if you haven't. However, today we're discussing one of my favorite shows with one of my favorite people, Miss Mallory Rubin, the head of editorial for The Ringer and co-host of Binge Mode, has joined me today. Hi, Mal. Juliette, my job is to get you the ball. (laughs) <laughs> I'm your assistant. Think of it that way. I'm the Justin Herbert to your Keenan Allen, and it's an honor to be here with you. And I just want to say that I recently binged all of Selling Sunset and cannot oh. wait for future conversation right here on Bachelor Party. Let's talk about it a little bit at the end. But first, oh, okay. Let's just say, I mean, we must say today you are here not only as my trusted colleague and friend, but as a football fan, because we are discussing the HBO program Hard Knocks, which this season is focusing on the two Los Angeles football teams, the Chargers and the Rams. That's right. uh, there's been two episodes. It's being recapped on our website by Kalen Jones. So please read it. Read what he has to say. Um, please. And I want to talk about Hard Knocks because, first of all, it's a great show. I mean, it's just like incredible. It's incredible work. The fact that, that NFL films turns it around as quickly as they do is honestly astonishing. Like it shames everyone who works in documentary and reality TV. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's, like it's remarkable, especially this year with two teams, you know, being able to process and distill everything from two different training camps with all of the variables, uh, obviously with the, the pandemic and the COVID protocols and everything else happening in NFL training camps right now, all of the unknowns to, to, to be able to turn all of that into one hour of TV that quickly and make it feel current when so much of sports and mass right now is definitionally a moving target is, yeah. is incredible. Also, two, it's an hour, two teams usually just have one and yet still way too much like football practice. I don't, I don't need to see the scrimmages. Like it's so, stupid. Oh, I love that. I love Why? that part. Why? Well, a few reasons. I mean, as you noted, I, just, I love football. You know, I don't always feel great about loving football, but I love football. It's a big part of my life. And I enjoy the, well, I mean, look, like I don't want to overstate it. Nothing is an unvarnished look at an NFL team. Of course, they know they're on camera. They know they're mic'd up. That's, I want to discuss that. What what we're seeing and the choices being made. (laughs) Yes, that's obviously like part of the buy-in as a viewer of Hard Knocks. So again, I don't want to overstate what level of, documentarian achievement is actually unfolding on our screens, but it is ultimately still interesting to just see what the rhythms of NFL life are, what they look like. You know, I, I, I like one of the, the ringer stories that I, I've always loved is Kevin Clark's piece on Stefan Diggs wearing short shorts, you know, something like that. Like what, what's, what's everyone wearing? What's their style? How do the players interact with each other? What does it look like when they're running routes? You know, I like I always I always like to scout for my fantasy football drafts. Sure, yes, of course, who looks of crisp course. on the route running? <laughs> you know, all of that. I just like soak up every every second of it. And you know, you're a huge NBA fan, right? So mm-hmm. the NBA fan experience, I think, is in many ways more direct. There's a lot of access to the players on social media. You have, I think, a better feel as an NBA fan for what the players are thinking about and are interested in, what their lives are like. Again, only ever to a certain extent in sports, of course. But the NFL, that's just so rare. You know, so few NFL players are real personalities and give you that kind of access to their lives. You know, that's why, like, the people who, I mean, you get it a lot with, like, Russell Wilson, Tom Brady, some of that is because they're famous quarterbacks. Some of that is because they're married to famous people and have reached a level of celebrity status that is a little bit uncommon in the the NFL ranks. So it's just interesting. It's just always kind of foundationally interesting to me to get access to the players more than anything else. 
And like you said, this is an NFL film show, but I do think it's like, I, I think, and, and I just want to back up for one second and say one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is because one of the most fun episodes of Bachelor Party in the last couple of months was when I had Kevin Clark on to talk about Formula One because I became mm-hmm. obsessed with Formula One from the Netflix show. And like, I just love a compelling sports documentary so much. And yeah. Um, drive to survive is to F1 as Hart Knox is to, uh, the NFL for sure. And so if you liked F1 and if you liked the F1 show, definitely watch this. And just in general, like, I, I just think that like, it's one of the most compelling shows. I just want to give everyone the kind of disclaimer that like, if you get, if you get really into a rookie, like just, you need to detach because it means they're getting <laughs> cut from the team and just don't, don't get too upset. It's the worst is when they introduce you to these players striving to get out of the team and like you follow them for a few weeks and then they get cut and it's so upsetting. So don't get too attached. Just by one it's, piece of advice. If you're watching hard knocks, it's like, uh, it's honestly a hard knocks, a hard knocks staple is getting you to invest in either the veteran who's finally looking for his break or the rookie on the fringe, maybe a late round draft pick, maybe an undrafted free agent. Uh, You're getting that time so with the fan favorite. Yeah. We have, yeah. we have a couple who have emerged already this year. So it's uh, you know, earlier cuts this year too, right? Yeah. Of the COVID rosters. I mean, we might be saying, we might be saying goodbye to some of the emerging fan favorites earlier than usual this year. Seriously. So we'll, we'll talk about all that, but something you just said about like, is this like the unvarnished look or whatnot? I think one thing about the NFL and about football players is it to to do so is to be um extremely uh to, to be part of the NFL in general is to be extremely confident and to just have a level of arrogance that I think transcends reality TV. And so I think that a lot of what you're seeing is like probably what it actually is like because I think that they they don't think there's anything weird or wrong or suspect or to be considered about how football runs. Um, it's so conspicuous that there's no women in this show, except for the one woman who was helping, um, set up like the facilities with Sean McVay in the first episode. Like this is, this, I think is a pretty good look into the NFL. I don't, I'm not an expert, but I, I do think it's pretty, it's pretty good. And I think so many, and I watching it this season is incredibly interesting because of all the COVID stuff, which again, yeah. we'll discuss, but also I just think that everything with the chargers is really fascinating to me because, uh, the chargers have a blackhead coach and they have set up this QB battle in the show between, um, vet Tyra Taylor and, uh, the, the extremely remember the Titans esque quarterback Justin Herbert, who is a rookie from Oregon yes. and number six overall draft pick. That's yeah. And, and there's just a lot of, um, I think kind of like broader narratives around in the world and around football about race, like playing out in the show right now as well. And so it's, it's so fascinating. So we kind of hit on a lot of broad strokes. I want to die. There's been two episodes so far. Yes. I want to share some of my perceptions with you of these people Great. as reality TV characters, as you know, them as football professionals. Okay. And, Interesting. Uh, okay. And I thought, I thought that we also could just talk about the COVID of it all. I mean, I don't, Let's I don't do want it. to start there. I just, I don't. Although that's where it's the a, show it's, starts. It's, it's a bummer. It's, it's such a bummer. <laughs> I'd like to begin by discussing um, the two head coaches. So the head, so the two teams that they're following this season are the Rams and the Chargers. I have a question for you. Okay. Why do they do, te- do two teams other than the fact that they need to like make them popular because they're building a new stadium for them? So good question. I don't know the actual answer. Like, I don't know what the programming decision was especially because the rams were the featured team on hard knocks just a a few seasons ago they were very recently the featured team when they moved Um, to la right yes exactly and had you know just just jared goff fresh in the league oh my god i we could talk about the goff course jared goff's custom golf course for six hours as far as i'm concerned um the show has um changed a lot of my perceptions for me of the more famous figures that we've seen so far except Mm. for jared goff which has completely confirmed everything about him being like a total dork so on brand in in every respect i i we can definitely get into goff more but i think what quietly one of the funniest moments of the second episode of this week's episode was the, the, the moment of practice when goff's like that type of shit fires me up and he's like that's a nice job of regathering your poise and they as far as i could tell all they were talking about at that particular moment was walking and talking like the cadence in the huddle and calling a play at the line there was yeah. nothing particularly all dramatic they were talking about was how quick how quickly he was um 
he, they were getting the play going. Like, all, yeah. all, Had getting to out of the second huddle. time. Had to hear it a second time. I love. I love that. I love hearing that. Bizarre. <laughs> but in terms of in terms of the question of selecting the teams, so there are uh, there's kind of like a, a hard knocks brew in science. I won't claim to understand it perfectly, but basically, there are three ways in which a team can avoid being the featured team. If they have a first year head coach, if they've if they've if they've made the playoffs within the last uh, two seasons or if they've appeared on hard knocks in the past 10 years. So there were five teams that people thought would one of them would be chosen based on the other teams that in essence you could eliminate because of the criteria. And the five teams were the Cardinals, the Steelers, the Lions, the Jaguars and the Broncos. So the Chargers and the Rams were not on the radar. They just were not on the radar, let alone the prospect of selecting them together. The Rams went to the Super Bowl two years ago, and the Chargers That's have right. been in the playoffs like every year because of Philip Rivers, who's now gone. Chargers, you know, I'd say mixed bag in terms of their ability to deliver on their potential in a given year. But, you know, sure. that's a, that's another story. But they go to the playoffs a lot. They have, right? Well, they're, they're, they were consistently contenders, though not always, and obviously ended up with the, the sixth draft pick. Right. Uh, <laughs> last year. And Phil, but Phillip a lot Rivers. of injuries. A lot of Out. injuries. I thought that the Cardinals would be the team. Because the combination of Kyler Murray, young star quarterback, Cliff Kingsbury, young star Handsome. coach, just uh, Hollywood potential all around. It was not the Cardinals. That was a surprise. When, when the Rams were first on Hard Knocks in the, in the move to L.A., I think the L.A. aspect of it was seen as like kind of a double-edged sword. It was, oh, Hollywood, glitz and glam. Let's showcase a football team in LA. You know, you remember like the intro. Yeah, uh, of course. Seeing like Todd Gurley like running up to the Hollywood sign and everything. It was just so LA in so many respects. And the the flip side of that was the that you know, you'll recall when when the the football teams were relocating, a consistent part of the narrative around the NFL in LA is are people interested in it? Will they go to the games? Now, obviously that particular conversation point is is completely absent right now despite the impending launch of SoFi of the $5 billion right. super stadium, because it's it, fans aren't going to be at football games. Now they might be in certain cities. It's actually up to, it's basically a team by team, city by city decision, whether fans will be allowed to attend and, and how many fans can attend in, in each case. So what that actually will ultimately look like at SoFi or anywhere else is is like so many other things on the COVID front. And I know you wanted to wait to talk about that, you know, evolving in real time. Yeah. But the stadium, I think, would have probably been a huge part of the the show and the launch of this new LA experience right. and just maybe isn't going to be now. Nonetheless, huge look for SoFi. I was just like, God, <laughs> SoFi on the practice jerseys. That's that's like not yeah. normal. They certainly they must have done that for cameras and to get them out of value. New new uniforms for each team, slightly altered logos. You got these fresh looks. I find it uh, to be unfortunate timing that the the color schemes are closer together than I they've know. ever been before. Because it's like actually hard initially to to see which team you're with. I mean, obviously, if you're on a close shot and you see a player, you know, you know, you know which team, you know which team Jalen Ramsey's on. You know which yeah. team Derwin James is on. But those wide shots where it's just like I see white jerseys and blue shorts what hue of blue am i looking at can sometimes take a minute <laughs> well also just like with the nfl so money is so often the motivating factor and that's a that's that's what it is you know as they say as they say in the irishman and, and elsewhere but jared goff what's like the first thing he says maybe like his third line of the show is he comments on the new merch and so it just seems like there's a lot of sort of like ancillary business related aspects to like why they chose these two teams but i guess have- jared goff's other option would be commenting on his titanic cap hit and how that has completely hamstrung the roster building capabilities of his <laughs> team so probably better for him not to mention that um so we have the chargers and the rams and the yes. two like lead figures and this happens a lot on hard knocks that one of the stars the, the, the head coach often becomes a star because they drive a lot of training camp. It's their prep, mm-hmm. the cut downs and, and whatnot. Do you think that's correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the coach is always going to be a central figure. Every now and then you get a, a front office central figure, maybe a charismatic general manager. You know, someone, of course, in the cuts, you're always, you're always seeing the conversations around the cuts. And 
the first episode brought a, a very different glimpse of what that's going to look like this year. But yeah, the coaches are always going to be central. Yeah. And so that means this year, kind of the two leading figures are Sean McVay, who's sort of like the Hollywood coach of the NFL and Anthony, yes. and he's, he's the coach of the, of the Rams who um, right. blew it, blew it in the Super Bowl and tough two, one two years ago, very tough. And Anthony Lynn, who is um, the former runner running back and now head coach at the chargers. And that's right. Sean McVay as a ringer uh, employee and a fan of sport, Sean mm-hmm. McVay has ha- had like a big reputation to me as like kind of like a slick figure in football and sort of like the future of the game. And if you read the ringer, um, you were very much aware that like everyone was trying to copy Sean McVay for one season. And then they have, right. they flamed out last season. So it's like a, a little bit less in vogue, but sort of like been billed as like Sean, the, the league has been billing him as like the future of thinking about football. He's kind of like, I don't know, just a, a kind of like a, a mind that's being heralded. And my takeaway upon watching two episodes of Hard Knocks is that I hate Sean McVay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's, is this is this based on him as a reality TV figure per your setup, or do you do you dislike him as a coach? I would I dislike him as a coach. I'm not saying his his ideas about football are bad, but his mm-hmm. coach personality is so grating to me that I would probably request a trade. I cannot imagine taking directions from Sean McVay. He's so annoying and like <laughs> obviously really feeling himself. And yeah. Oh, my, yeah. My question for you is, is the Sean McVay that we're seeing on the show matching your perceptions of him as um, the way he's been written about for the last few years? Yeah, I haven't had a ton of moments with Sean McVay so far through, again, admittedly only two episodes where I'm like, huh, this is a this is a real surprise to me. You know, it's sort of the <laughs> it's sort of the Sean McVay experience. I mean, he's like part of the school of football wonder boys who come up incredibly quickly through the ranks. I mean, he's he's 34, right? He he became a head coach extraordinarily. He's, he's early. our contemporary. So you're you're That's soon right. to turn 34 and he's our contemporary. <laughs> That's right. Birthday coming up, man. Whew. We're in, we're inside a month here. Oh my god. I don't think I realized that until you just said it. Wow. I've I have as you know no sense of time time or space during quarantine <laughs> at all. Though I have a the vague sense obviously that Hard Knocks is on and thus football must be close and thus September must be close. Anyway. Um I I you know there are moments like the actual the end of uh the second episode where, you know, they show you all of these little snapshots of humor, levity, personality, right? Those are the moments where you're supposed to say, oh, these are who these guys really are. And the the Sean McVay moment that we got was him, uh, like a faux apology for taking his shirt off, right? He's just like trying very hard to be funny, trying very hard to be hip. There was the moment where he was earlier in the episode this week, you know, trying to make fun of Andrew Whitworth for being old and then had to be like, come on, guys, that was funny. I mean, it's just like you kind of cringe a little bit watching it. But I think that that I live and breathe football and it is an inextricable part of my DNA is just what I have always assumed that the Sean McVay experience was. Um, I, you know, I I didn't I, I was it was great to meet his dog in the first episode. As you know, I'm an animal enthusiast. I had some concerns about the 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 basketball booping on the nose, you know, maybe a softer ball. That's How did my that note. not hurt the dog? That's my thing. Like that just seems like a very hard ball bizarre. to use. Maybe a that softer was, ball. Th- what, that's like throw. You're throwing a basketball at your dog's face. That's really bizarre. I just found not him a fan really, of that. really grating. I found his air, his like confidence to be arrogance, and I found his like the way that he like barks at the players just really annoying. I don't think it like has to be that way. I, not that mm-hmm. I've played football, but I just found it really annoying and. It, Moreover, for television purposes, he's such a good um, juxtaposition to Anthony Lynn, who is the very chill elder yes. coach. And he's not old, but like just has more of like an elder statesman statesman vibe to him. We first meet him when he's like smoking meat on at his home, and he, you know, he Great refers scene. to he refers to the big three, God, family, and football. And I, you know, he just sort of like 
he's a lot more of what I think I was like hoping for from my from my football coach. But mm-hmm. moreover, I was just like, I want to be a Chargers fan. This man seems nice. And he also doesn't seem like a bullshitter. I thought Sean McVay seemed like actually a bullshitter. Where like, he'd be like, when he's like, I love that. I love that you're, you're t- you need to hear it two times. <laughs> like, no, you don't. You don't want Jared Goff to be spending training camp, like getting out of the huddle faster. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I just yeah. thought that Anthony Lynn actually seemed like way more honest. And I was like, I'm a Chargers fan. Fuck the Rams. Yeah, I will say, I think that's been one of the, surprises of hard knocks so far that the chargers have been maybe the more interesting team to watch. I'm not surprised at all that Anthony Lynn has been as compelling as he has been that, that he's, he's just a fascinating guy and like an incredibly uh, charismatic person. I, I loved the, the, the grilling scene that you just cited the watching him interact with his wife, the moment where, um, he, he, you know, she's she's like you're you're tying a napkin around yeah. my like n- nice cutlery, and can I get you a brush? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was just great. And you know the way he's wearing his the the Porsche hat, the you know the agency shirt, and it's he's just so sharp and smooth, and again, just such a compelling, compelling coach and a compelling person. I think that the fact that the Chargers in mass have seemed to be interesting television is a little bit of a surprise to me like obviously whenever a team drafts a quarterback high in the draft and again they took you know they, they finished five and 11 last year they had the sixth overall pick they took herbert that's always gonna be interesting but like justin herbert is not necessarily the most dynamic personality and i okay. think that can we pause there for one second yeah sure yeah part of how they introduced justin herbert this is incredible te- television making was Obviously, he's really boring because he doesn't speak on the show. And that they explain that by being like, well, when he was at Oregon, there was no huddle. Let the play you know? do the talking, right? Let the play do the talking. <laughs> and that I thought that was unbelievable. I was like, incredible shout out to the makers of this TV show to to like <laughs> rely on football to explain why this like guy who's objectively very handsome, looks like an Abercrombie model. Like you could see him in a billboard at the mall and be like, yeah, it makes sense. Like why we will not be hearing from him. And I, I just thought that was like absolutely hilarious. Like that's, that's not how you make a, a compelling documentary is by having someone not speak. And yet right. it's just really working. <laughs> well, the, the, the question of who ends up being a central figure on hard knocks is I think always one of the, the most interesting ones. Cause there are uh, almost every season. There are a couple famous players household names who just end up not being a part of it and it's like well were they not interested were they not good tv you know whatever the specifics are we don't we don't typically find out and then sometimes you end up spending a lot of time with people who maybe they're good tv but aren't ultimately instrumental to the future of the team's fortunes and then every now and then you get the mix right herbert i just want to say i think that he he was so he was an elite draft prospect for a couple of years. It was kind of a surprise that he ended up going, going back to Oregon, came out a year later. It, 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 one of the knocks around him during draft time was, I think, quite unfair. And this happens often if, in NFL circles where something about a player's personality ends up being uh, fully baked into whether or not they can play football in terms of how NFL teams or NFL draft experts or draft experts in the media assess their potential. And the fact that he was like quiet and reserved was something that people often tossed out as a reason not to draft him highly, which I just always found to be like kind of emblematic of how the of one of the many, yeah. many ways in which the NFL can be sort of weird, right? And gro- a little bit gross in terms of how they view players as people or, yeah. or or don't accept something about who they are as people. So it's been even just the little glimpses of hearing Herbert talk and seeing him interact. Like I just, I loved that scene with him and Keenan Allen. And seems the, like a really nice guy. Yeah. The deference, I the, like the deferential nature of that exchange is very contrary to the star quarterback experience, but felt very of a piece with the Herbert experience. And so I liked that. Like, even though you're not getting a lot of him, you're getting snapshots that I think convey something true to who he is. Were the shots of him um, doing target practice impressive to you? Yes, I thought so. And now look, there's the, the, what's one of the classic things that you hear in, in the football circles, like you're doing it against air, right? Yeah. Try doing it against an actual defense and an actual live full speed defense. It's obviously a different thing entirely, but 
his uh you know to, to go into draft speak like his arm talent is has never been a question i mean he has a cannon some accuracy concerns though for him at at, at oregon in college and you know just seeing him nail target after target net after net it's one of those things where the watching the actual throws and the axe the tight spiral like i always love the glam cam it's pretty hard be- pretty tight spiral, so yeah. it's great right but <laughs> the actual throws were less notable to me than seeing the reactions from his teammates and the coaches. Like when you get those moments where you hear them whisper to each other, like, damn, like, yeah, kid can really throw. And yeah. Oh, I haven't seen a ball like that in a while. Like that stuff is actually, I think pretty cool and pretty telling again, you know, we'll see when, when he's, when he's out there against the Super Bowl winning chiefs <laughs> twice a year in his division, <laughs> should he win the job. This episode is brought to you by VH1's new series, RuPaul's Drag Race, The Vegas Review. In this new reality series, RuPaul's opening a live Las Vegas residency and has invited six of the most legendary queens in drag race history to put on the most sensational show of all time. See what it's really like to go behind the queens and follow their Vegas journey. As the pressure builds, relationships are pushed to the brink, and with Ru as their boss, the stakes have never been higher. From love affairs that will make you gag to all-out backstage catfights that will leave you shook. Witness Drag Race favorites Vanessa Vangie Mateo, Evie Oddly, Naoma Smalls, Cameron Michaels, Asia O'Hara, and Derek Barry as they try to work together. Will they be able to slay the odds with these drag superstars? One thing is for sure, you can always bet on the queens to showcase their charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent. Don't miss RuPaul's Drag Race Vegas Review, new series premiere Friday, August 21st, 8, 7 central, only on VH1. I, you mentioned a lot of different kinds of stars. And I think that the person who kind of is the, the nexus of all those different strands, as it became apparent in episode two, very clearly Jalen Ramsey. And I think mm-hmm. um, just some great Jalen Ramsey content. Let's let's he's uh, exceptional. I mean, I knew about him because he's mega. He's like mega star, mega famous. Obviously, um, I think like if you're a, a hipster like sports fan and like I, I don't like to think that I'm not but I'm certainly in the hipster sports fan world do you like kind of like follow the Jags of the last few years they've become the butt of so many jokes and so the fact yep. that he was on the Jags just made him even more famous weirdly though that's like not a good market I love Jalen Ramsey because I love the honesty that he brings like he's just yes. like I was so happy to be traded to LA <laughs> one of the he's one of the best days of his life yeah and then, that was incredible <laughs> it was amazing seeing him fight with the media over zoom I mean like that so basically um as part of training camp, they, the and the NBA players are doing this too in the bubble. The athletes have to sit in front of a uh, branded um, step and repeat and answer questions mm-hmm. over Zoom from the media. Jalen Ramsey is has one year left on his deal. He's a um, an, an all pro player, and he doesn't have a new deal yet. They ask him about it, and he won't answer. He just says, "My agent and the front office will figure it out." He was obviously told to say that. Probably wanted to say that. He very clearly didn't want to discuss his contract. And I I can't blame him. It's like kind of weird like it's it is personal it's just we it's like you know if i was like mallory let's discuss your contract with spotify on on a podcast that would be so fucking strange uh it's part of it's part of being in in sports so we get that but like i understand where he's coming from and that's kind of the point of the show it was thrilling seeing him fight with the media like from his perspective i absolutely loved it yeah i mean he's He's just tremendous. And that ultimately is, you know, to go back to, to your setup of like, what's the Venn diagram of great football player, great reality TV, like Jalen Ramsey is all of it, you know, yeah. all of it truly and in full. And he's one of the best defenders in the NFL period. And and it, this is actually, that's another thing, by the way, that's interesting about this season of hard knocks. You know, obviously there've been plenty of seasons of hard knocks where there have been good defenders. I, I, I don't want to, can I guess what you're going to say? Please. All of the intrigue is about defensive players. The best players on the teams are defenders. Yeah. yeah. And which is, it, which like, if you, again, I, most of my football information comes from being a part of the ringer. So like, to me, I'm like, yeah, of course the defense, it's like, it's like, and that's because that's what like core football players, like, I mean, football fans, I think like to discuss, but it's certainly not what sells tickets or merch usually. Yeah. I mean, Aaron Donald is the best defender in the NFL and Jalen Ramsey is one of the best defenders in the NFL. They're obviously both on the Rams. And then on the Chargers side, Joey Bosa and Derwin James are also two of the best defenders in the NFL, not only at their position groups, but full stop. So that's a little like, listen, 
Joey, you're not going to build five weeks of reality TV around Joey Bosa. Could barely get right? five minutes out of his signing his $135 million <laughs> contract. I did enjoy the the conversation between uh, Bosa and Melvin Ingram about Branzino, though. That was oh my God. <laughs> the, whole, the whole fish, but not going to eat the rice. It's a great show. Um, Don't want to eat the eyeballs, but the merits of the Branzino, that was, that was a great discussion. But Jalen Ramsey is, you know, in a, he was fifth overall draft pick, was a star at Florida State has been a star in the league the entire time that he's been in the league again the 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 trade situation i mean that was high drama the entire time that it was unfolding and now for that to continue into you know the the the, the amount of draft capital that the rams gave up to get jalen ramsey it's not like on the one hand you say okay well you're 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 going for a title if you're the rams every year i mean they didn't you know, obviously hugely disappointing season last year coming off of the the prior uh super bowl attempt but the goal is to maximize this window with this roster and try to win. So you make that trade if you can get a player like Jalen Ramsey, no matter what. And in general, the nature of what a what a trade for an elite defender or an elite player period looks like in the NFL has has changed in recent seasons. But the the, the flip side of that is you you really don't make a deal like that unless you intend to sign him long term, right? right? Of course. I mean, you ha- you won't, you almost have to. If they lost him, if they did not lock him down to a contract, it would be catastrophic in terms of what they had given up to get him and what where that leaves their roster moving forward in terms of the ability to rebuild. Now, of course, we don't have to get into too many of the football the nitty gritty dynamics, but like there's the the cap consideration versus the draft capital. Be that as it may, you want Jalen Ramsey to be there long term. That's why you traded for him, and so you get like moments in this week's episode like where you hear the the, the the on-field mics are picking him up saying that he's not like kd and then his quote is like i'm like lebron slash Kawhi." <laughs> to be honest you can't amazing. script that that's perfection amazing and then seeing him house hunting okay that's where i wanted to get to jalen ramsey was house hunting and yes. um you and i live in los angeles so we have like a, a deep interest in this kind of thing um, absolutely he was looking, we want to thank you to our colleague, uh, Jeff, for sending us the listing for his house that he was looking at. Um, I don't think he bought it, or at least he hasn't, uh, he hasn't made an offer yet, or I don't know, because it's still active, but it is in Bell Canyon and it, which is in the Valley, as he said, right near Thousand Oaks. It's $5.6 million, five bedrooms, five and a half baths, 6,751 square feet. My first takeaway, that's a really small number of rooms for almost 6,000 square feet. Like, that's weird. <laughs> a lot of open spaces. Nice open floor plan right there on the top of your own mountain or hill, whatever it is. One of my favorite parts about it was that he went to look at it his, at his roommate with his, like, what they call in the show, his roommate. I thought that was really funny because it it's not just a myth. Like, famous athletes, like, have, like, a group of friends that kind of just, like, come with them when they're younger until they, I think, settle down with families. And, like, obviously, he's not going to live in this house alone. So I really like that Jalen Ramsey, like, brought his friend to see if his friend would want to live there, too. But Jalen Ramsey is a father. Jalen Ramsey has kids and has family. And if you look at his Instagram, is like, just loves his children. I mean, it's, like, Well, he said this would be really nice for my daughters. Yes. And, obviously, I was going to ask you this because you watch a lot of real estate reality TV. Yes, I do. I was blown away by the custom staging putting family photos and have you ever seen anything like this no i'd never seen anything like that i thought it was unreal and i i felt like jalen ramsey's agent like the his as a buyer like whoever his agent is must have worked really hard with um the seller or maybe it's just their own listing to Mm -hmm. stage this and i was just thinking like wow this is incredible and they must really want to sell this house (laughs) i thought that was like really sweet i there's something about jalen ramsey for all the bravado that i find to be very sweet he's he's just great i he's one of my absolute favorite athletes i'd love to have i'd love for him to have his own show he should get one maybe he can be on uh, season four of selling sunset we can bring all of this together (laughs) if he's still hunting for houses then and i think i think one thing one of the reasons why jalen ramsey is so compelling on the show is because he is kind of like one of the only storylines outside of him having to do a zoom press conference or zoom media availability that feels kind of COVID free. Everything else on this show, the last two episodes is completely influenced, obviously as all of our lives are by the ongoing uh, pandemic. And um, one thing that's really interesting about the show is that 
the NBA was very public about how they were going to do their bubble as was MLS and WNSL and, um, baseball is very public about their lack of bubble um, <laughs> and just sort of like the COVID protocols for the sports leagues has been a hot button topic. And I think people mm-hmm. sports feels more important than ever as a distraction. And so people like want it to happen, but there's all these ethical questions around it. Um, right. And so getting, getting the window into how these two NFL teams are dealing with it has been like really fascinating. And I'm, I'm curious, like what was your gut reaction to seeing um the setup being like this is the covid season because that is and and i think a, there was no choice but to do this in my mind but mm-hmm. you just never know with the nfl like it had to be like the covid season of hard knocks right but like right. yeah would absolutely. you have been surprised if they hadn't done that i wouldn't have been completely surprised but <laughs> no i mean i think again t- to the point you made earlier you know because it's the nfl I I never rule anything out in terms of what might be obscured or spun. Yeah. What kind of like brand management image uh, th- they're going to be efforting. And so I, I, I think that I'm trying to like almost, you know, because the first two episodes have been so riveting. It's almost hard to like return to the, the pre premiere. He- They've head, been head riveting. Space. They they really have. And I thought the, the first episode particularly so. And for the reason that you're describing now, which is, I think heading into Hard Knocks, I personally was anticipating scene after scene where it felt like we were just about to glimpse something meaningful and then didn't, you know, and where maybe there was like mounting frustration about the actual lack of insight into Mm -hmm. anything tangible and concrete. Part of that is because it's, again, the NFL and that's uh, ingrained in the NFL experience. And part of it is because I think the, the COVID protocols for the league have been very much developing in real time. You know, we actually got an interesting, there was a moment in the second episode where um, uh, Seth Ryan, who's a, qu- a quality control coach on the Chargers, Rex Ryan's kid, test positive. We see the, the, the cleaning his station. The Everyone's position, freaked out. The position coach meeting with the receiving group about, what this might mean. And then of course he ends up coming back. They say it was a false positive. And the reason I mentioned this is because not only watching everyone react to that in, in real time, but there was like a little, a little moment where I think what he said was that the NFL had just approved basically that you needed to get the negative on the, um, on the the, the 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 regular standard test and the quick test, and if you yeah. got both both of those as negatives, you could come back, and that that was a recent change, is I think what he said. So like that, those kinds of insights into how much things are evolving in real time. Yeah. The, to go back to the first episode, though, actually, also before that, the moment in this in the second episode where Andrew Whitworth, vet offensive lineman on the Rams, was with his wife talking about how the entire family I know got I sick. Know. Yeah. That was like just horrifying. Horrifying. You know? Horrifying. They're, I think his father was in the hospital for five days. I mean, just and and crazy. Just absolutely crazy. And the kids too. I mean, and yeah. it was interesting Awful. hearing them say that um I think they believe they got it from their nanny, right? Um and and they were like, yeah, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I, I don't think that is how I would have framed it. I, I don't think it was like a f- fluke that if you go out to a restaurant, you might get COVID. I mean, who, you know, I don't have a ton of details about the inciting incident or transmission, but I, I think it's really interesting um, to see how people are framing this for themselves and for mm-hmm. others, because everyone every day has to decide what level of risk are you willing to live with, with COVID. And right. We're seeing that, and before the season started, they weren't or training camp started. They weren't really subject to NFL rules. So hearing uh, and, and Anthony Lynn had it too. Well, and so right. yeah, so hearing everyone talk through like what works for them and what doesn't work for them is really fascinating. And I think it's like I, you know, I'm not sure if you watch Lennox Hill on Netflix, which I recommend. It's also like incredibly intense though. If and if you've ever, if you or anyone in your family has ever had like a serious medical incident that's required going to the hospital a lot and doctors and nurses, I think it's kind of, um, triggering, but Mm -hmm. I really, I recommend it. They had an extra episode about COVID and it's, um, I think kind of remarkable to be getting a documentary work in real time at 
about COVID because yes, it's so hard to process and understand what we're going through. And so to see it through this kind of like documentary lens with the polish of NFL films, the voiceover, the music is kind of shocking. It's almost like, it's almost like a relief. It's very, it's a very strange experience. Yeah. I think the, the what, what you're saying about kind of how each individual person is processing this it ha- has been one of, one of the most fascinating parts of, of the two episodes so far, you know, uh, uh, you, you mentioned Anthony Lynn had COVID. That was that was news in the first episode. That had, had not been out there previously. Hearing him, I, I, I was like, my I, my eyes were wide and my jaw was open listening to him describe it. How he was watching a golf tournament and hearing about the symptoms of a golfer who had tested positive. He's like, man, I, that's how I feel right now. And then went and got tested and realized he had it. And then hearing him describe how ostracized he felt while he was sick and going through something where there's not, uh, oh, here's your prescription and you'll be fine. That's not what this is at all, right? And obviously, like, Anthony Lynn was able to recover and not everybody has been that fortunate. And this is a a, a horrifying disaster in our country. Yeah. and. That is, you know, as, as you said at the, the opening here, the one of the inherent contradictions right now is that for sports fans, you miss sports. You want to watch sports, of course, but I think that Hard Knocks has forced football fans to reckon with what that means for the people yeah. who are playing it. And I think, sure, I don't want to imply that people weren't reckoning with that already. I think a lot of people, you know, us included, have been thinking about that constantly. What does this mean? The The, the athletes who are, putting themselves at risk what is that for who is that for and i thought that the opening sequence the opening scenes of the first episode were just like astonishing in that respect totally players were scared the players were scared and it was like i thought just gut-wrenching and not just she's about to cry you can't you guys can't see it (laughs) (laughs) i did i honestly found it like pretty moving I found there's a real sadness to this season. I sort of felt like I also found watching them suffer through these endless zoom meetings and like having clear zoom fatigue. I really found that to be the most relatable thing. (laughs) And then, and then seeing all of the players be nervous to get the test. So like, what's this going to feel like Is one of them's like, it's a Q-tip for your nose. Like I thought that was also like, also like not, I don't want to be like hashtag relatable, but like just something that I think we're all going through. And it's so rare that hard knocks, outside of like the human emotion of like the disappointment of getting cut. Like that's usually where the human element comes, but this is so much more um, like helpful and understanding our our just joined experience. And, and yeah, I mean, I also think that like the NFL is not really known for player empowerment, but I think in some ways this season of hard knocks is, is changing how I, how I see some of, some of that and some of the relations. And I think seeing the players kind of like be ask, asking questions and, um, talking about the restrictions they have to deal with and, and whatnot. And then like, you know, the rookies have to stay in a hotel and that, they're that, like, yeah, they're, that part they're, is brutal. They're embarking on an incredibly difficult career mentally and physically. They're doing it in isolation. Um, they like, don't really know what's going on. It's like, so it's just like, it's so sad. And like, you can't be with your family. You can't get comfortable. And I don't know. It's just the the whole thing is like, it's eerie. It's, it also was, um, they showed a lot of shots of LA and yeah. LA just like looks so, so dead. Like there was no yeah. traffic on the four Oh five, which they showed. It's like, yeah, I'm sure there's not right now. Um, yeah, and yeah. The, 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 to the put to your point about rookies and the younger players who are trying to achieve a lifelong dream. I that part of the second episode I, I thought was again kind of like oh this is actually genuinely impactful the the Austin Eckler sequence mm. you know love that guy it, he seems like a delight it's wonderful I loved when, when everyone was dunking on him because he had his shorts on backwards great stuff yeah. <laughs> but you know that's somebody who has been able to become a featured back in the NFL, land a big contract. I mean, again, big, relatively speaking, running backs in the NFL. That's a whole nother conversation. But 
That was because he got a couple reps in a preseason game and was able to yeah. show the coaches something they hadn't seen before. And that's just gone. And I thought that it was like pretty, pretty touching to hear the players talk about that in this episode. And I, I liked, I mean, I think there will probably be many moments moving forward and ensuing episodes where we hear from the rookies directly even more yeah. than we have already about like what it feels like to be working as hard as you can and trying as hard as you can. You know, like we got a lot of time with um, Darius Bradwell this week is a, a two lane running back undrafted about his conditioning. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll be continuing oh with that storyline. So but like, upsetting. He's not making the he's not making the team, and I'm already upset. I we'll see. I hope he does. I mean, he's he's working hard, but the parts where like uh, Aaron Donald and Andrew Whitworth and these veterans who were established stars in the league, and like in theory, it could just be like I'm focused on my own business. We're working with their position groups, like we're working with the young players to give them that almost like becoming coaches in real yeah. time to give them that feedback and that guidance because everybody out there knows everybody out there knows that those moments that used to be precious aren't even there anymore. Right. And so how do you try to approximate that or replicate that when all you can do is go through a walk through a practice or OK, they finally have helmets on practicing against each other like what are you even going to be able to show and what does it mean if you've worked your whole life for something and that opportunity isn't there and like I, I liked the the sequences that we got this week with um with clay johnson the the rams rookie linebacker seventh round pick out yeah. of baylor and like because you know i thought of him when you said earlier like how confidence is such a baked in part of the nfl experience and i thought it was just like again fascinating to see a player basically say i I don't feel confident right now i feel like i'm i'm fucking up or he he wasn't cursing he was saying fudge i i I feel like i'm messing up every time i'm out there and asking his veteran teammates like how do you do it like just do it just go through the rhythms of what this is and what this demands and what this requires like exchanges like that that's what hard knocks is to me. You just don't get access to stuff like that otherwise. It's pretty cool. And I think rookies are particularly good for this because they are not well versed in being in front of a camera. They're not they're not as used to the kind of attention that comes with being a professional athlete. I mean, obviously, to even get to the NFL level, you have grown up playing football to a in, in to a on a level that most people can't understand. And like there's it's just a, it's just a different way of living. I mean, that's like right. one of my biggest takeaways from my my time working in sports media is that athletes professional athletes even if they're on a practice squad for a week are special they have lived a life that i can barely understand i think i have like a a a sense of it from being in this profession but like that's one of the reasons why i think sports is so amazing and why it's when you get a sports documentary it's pretty cool is because these these players live totally rarefied lives and then there's like the cream of the crop like the famous you know there's 32 starting quarterbacks and there's probably like a hundred players in the league who are like so much better at the thing they do than anyone even comes close to. Right. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. know, like I just love excellence. And I think that's like (laughs) one of the, one of the exciting parts of like a really good sports documentary. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It's just like, there's the COVID stuff is like just so wild. I think that everyone is struggling to like really put this in perspective. And I, I have spent a lot of time personally wondering like, how will we remember coronavirus? How will this be written about? Like, what's the story that's going to be told in 50 years? Um, I, I think about that with like 9-11 as well, which is like 20 years removed from and stuff like just like sort of like big national events. I think about that a lot. And so it's been really cool to see how this show is handling it. And and it's just part of the remarkable parts of of Hard Knocks, regardless of the season, is that it's happening in real time. Like episode one c- comes out two weeks after the events that you see on the show. Like that's crazy. And so it also, it's nice to get a warning, you know, in the news, which players are caught before you see it on the show. So it's, really helpful i i I just find it the first time i really watched hard knocks and this like became apparent this part of the show it devastated me i'm it's so like i feel like the way that you often feel about um animals and like it's like the the, how you get really emotional is how i feel about the cuts on hard knocks i can't i can't handle it it's so sad to me well you're getting attached to them as characters but also as people and as players like people trying to launch a career yeah, you 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 know, the NFL doesn't always allow you to understand the players as people and the hard knocks giving you even like a, a bit of that is is the important thing. I hope, you know, I hope we get more 
uh, conversations around protests. You know, we we had the Zoom meeting um, among some members of the the Chargers, Chargers in episode yeah. one. I really hope we see more conversations like that. Obviously, it's we, we will we will continue to see COVID covered in full. Like, I, I'm sure that each new episode will give us a new insight. Like, you know, episode episode one i was like what are the, what's everyone wearing on their wrists what what are those and then episode two we got the answer yeah right? these are the sensors that if you're if you're not social distancing if you're standing too close to somebody it's gonna it's gonna be your head and seeing all those moments where the players are like get away from me i think we'll we'll you know we'll continue to that's just gonna be that was pretty uh, interesting and on on the protest front there's a lot of ways to interpret this and i'm curious what most people thought but the main moment that they show is coaches and vets explaining to not be mad at your play, your fellow player if they don't kneel and that there's a lot of reasons why that could happen and that's okay and everyone's protest looks different. And I thought it was really interesting choice um, to highlight that part of the conversation, which I actually think is really fascinating. And I'm, I actually have been interested on hearing from other players responding to their fellow um, basketball players, football players, whatever it is, not kneeling and what that means to them. This is like um, an ongoing controversy in Formula One. Um, and then like one player on the Magic, Jonathan Isaacs, and then Neil in the NBA. And I think that like hearing the players talk amongst themselves about that is really fascinating to me. I I don't have a strong feeling or opinion about it personally. I don't think I could not being an NBA or NFL player. Um, but I also think there's like a cynical way of viewing that given the NFL's history of discouraging protest. And so... I'm curious to see how that plays out as well. That really stuck out to me. I was like, this is an odd way of characterizing what was obviously a very long conversation. Yeah. I want to hear from the players on that as often as we can moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. I I totally agree. Um, And it was, it was cool. It was really cool to see that. Um, Let's just do five quick minutes on selling sunset. By the way, hard knocks, hard knocks, check it out. HBO Tuesday (laughs) nights. I'm not being paid to, to tell you that. I just think it's a great show. Uh, Mallory, just give me yes. your, like your personal top level summary of selling oh, sunset, man. which we have not discussed. And I wish we had not once, not once. Yeah. Well, I literally just watched it. This is <laughs> incredible. Weekend. I mean, I, I think that I think Adam and I started it last Thursday. And by the end of the weekend, we had finished the entire thing. Obviously nice. each season is eight episodes and they're quite short. Also, as I've told you, before as both my colleague and my friend, I would not say that I've been sleeping much lately. So a lot of like, you know, those those hours from like uh, midnight to, to 2 a.m. Prime prime for <laughs> selling sunset binging uh, and, and baking that into the workday. Uh, I thought it was how do how do I even describe it? I want more of the houses like I want more actual real estate. I'd like to when we're in each of the houses fewer of these quick camera swings through the rooms, more data points. On the houses each are all house. ugly. That's like the main problem with the show. Well, it's a certain type of real estate, right? Because of, yeah. of where they're, where they're mostly focused. But I, you know, I just, I love seeing <laughs> these <laughs> LA jewels, a uh, hideous jewel or not. And I want to see more of those. Sure. But other than that, I mean, it's, basically like a flawless reality tv experience i find the inherent um premise to be like uh, to like skin to make my skin crawl it's like so bizarre that these two dudes <laughs> who have their company hire a bunch of beautiful women and then like put their names on on top of the sign at each listing it's just like i find that part <laughs> so so weird and creepy but um can i just tell you on on the topic of brett and jason brett's out brett's out christine broke the news on it probably not not was supposed to brett's out he started his own brokerage i i've fallen into the the googling already so i'm i'm amazingly aware of this (laughs) brett is out which like is not a loss for the tv show brett is the uh justin herbert of selling set that doesn't speak that much we're, I, I was proud of myself that after mere episodes, I was able to tell Brett and Jason apart by both sound oh my God. and sight. Yeah, I, I've, I've landed that pretty quickly. I was proud. Jason has a different kind of confidence than Brett, in my opinion. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. I think Brett's yeah. the more confident one. Interesting. Oh. Okay. But so maybe I, want... I can't tell them apart. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Again, that 
that dynamic is very strange, obviously. Yeah. And I want to see more of the houses. But the show is just like, it's so addictive. It's unbelievably addictive. I, I could have watched unquestionably like 4,000 episodes in a row without <laughs> ever tiring of it. I mean, maybe there were a couple moments where I picked up my phone to like look at Twitter or respond to a text because we were lingering on a given storyline a little too long for my liking. But it is the characters, the characters like Christine is like a like a comic book villain. In a way, it's uh, I mean, she is just I I saw a picture of her recently without makeup on and she looked shockingly different. Like sh- it was shocking, oh, Mallory. Yeah. Interesting. I, she's she's quite quite the character. Quite oh, my God. Character. I mean, it's one of those things where she's such a riot, but then you feel like an awful human being when you laugh at the things she's saying because they're yeah. so mean, like so yeah, hurtful. It's just like it also like feels like it can't be real. Well, that. Yeah. I mean, how much of this is just you know the fact that obviously this is of course part of the reality tv experience but like every consequential conversation about something in their lives is happening at lunch with with, you know the producers or over a drink or something but man watching the nature of their relationships with each other change like the evolution of the mary christine friendship fascinating to behold Uh, davina oh my lord i i i I don't even know where to begin (laughs) davina is so mean that Again, it's like hard. It's just like that can't be real. No one can be that mean. <laughs> I don't oh know. Oh my god! It's so, I don't it's know. Questioning Chriselle, being like, "Well, we need to hear side of his side of the story." You don't know him. You don't need to hear his side of the story. Okay, so that to me is the perfect distillation of the Selling Sunset experience because you're watching that conversation on the side, right? Yeah, and you're you're horrified. You're like, I can't believe. That they're saying this, that they think this, that this could be the way anybody's mind could work, that you could process information about somebody in your life, someone you know, in this fashion, and then say it out loud when you know a cameras are on you. And oh my God, what drama will unfold from this when Chriselle watches this and learns that they said this, and then they say it to her face. Davina says it to her face. Insane. It's like unbelievable. I was in shock. I, I just couldn't <laughs> believe it. It's like, how could you? bring yourself to say that to a person and obviously they're buying into the premise of creating the drama for the show but also it's like to some extent this is at least to some extent to what extent i don't know but to some extent this is this is this this is not real (laughs) apparently like if you look them up like most of them have very few sales but you know what it's okay i like this is a great approximation of uh, I, i think this is like accurately portrays a type of person in Los Angeles who is in the real estate business. So like, that's good enough for me. I have to say, I think because of COVID and because now there's three seasons on, it's gotten a lot of push. When I watched season one, I was like, this is good, but it's lacking something. Then season two, I liked, and then season three is really good. I think it's a perfect binge show. If you watch it in smaller pieces, I don't think it's as compelling, but that's, that's Netflix. Like they find content that works for their, they make content that works for their platform. Right. And so it kind of, it doesn't have to be the masterpiece that is uh, hard knocks because people just, it goes down easy. Yeah. I mean, even like I, you know, I watch as do you million dollar listing LA million dollar Love listing it. New York. Those are just, that's a different caliber yeah. of show, right? That selling sunset is not that, but also the million dollar shows are not made to, to be consumed in one weekend with like, you know, a, a, a new dry ice cocktail that Christine has inspired you to try concocting in your own <laughs> home. Like I, I find myself thinking regularly throughout the year between seasons, like what are Frederick and Ryan up to? You know, yeah. H- how are Josh and Bobby? Like have the Altmans had another child? Let me go to Instagram to find out. Like I really like those people are like a part of my life now. Yeah. And also in terms of actually understanding the dynamics of real estate in those cities and the and thus the like the, the economies of those cities, the markets in those cities, this is a different experience entirely. Like, I don't feel like I learned a single thing about real estate from watching Selling Sunset other than uh, how to vastly whiff on pricing a, a yeah. listing, which I, I learned a couple of times. <laughs> and like to um, check yourself. Yeah. But they're just, you know, in terms of the drama, I mean, it's like it's like watching mean girls for three seasons 100 percent. christine probably wishes she was in mean girls well i i just 
I just want to tease. I have, I have some really good selling sunset content coming next week. So I'll keep you posted. Can't wait to listen. Thank you so much for joining me. It's always a delight to have you on this podcast. And uh, thank you. Well, I'll be back on Monday. Thanks for having me, pal. <laughs>